issue that obviously isn't going to go away. Uh, and being based in Victoria, which is a drying and warming part of the country, we see that this is a very much a strategic issue. Uh, and we want to invest in science and scientists. You know, if you have a country where you don't have real depth of knowledge, then you're prone to, uh, I guess, issues which may affect health or, um, or cost us too much if regulations aren't well written or based on a strong evidence base. So we're very happy to be supporting this event. Just briefly, Melbourne Water produces about 350 gigalitres annually of water, drinking water, about 70 gigalitres of recycled water, and we manage two large waterway catchments. So the issue of cyanobacteria affects each of those product streams uh, and can cost us a lot of money um, and a lot of angst. So I'm happy to uh, kick off this session on the molecular biology and toxicology of cyanobacteria and call up our first speaker, who's Jake Violi, We're talking on the prevalence of BMAA and its isomers in freshwater cyanobacteria isolated from Eastern Australia. Jake. Mm, thanks. Uh, you'll probably have to bear with me, it's my first time using a microphone, so see how it goes. Uh. All right. um, so hi, I'm Jake, um, I'm a PhD candidate at UTS, and uh, I'm going to talk about what I did in my honours work under the supervision of Simon Mitrovich, Anne Colville and Ken Rogers which was to determine the prevalence of BMA and its isomers in freshwater cyanobacteria iso isolated from eastern Australia. So I'm sure I don't have to go into what cyanobacteria are nor what blooms are, but just quickly, we know that cyanobacteria blooms are all throughout Australia. Um, Australia's different aquatic ecosystems, including lakes, reservoirs, and um, rivers. We know that there are certain conditions that can promote cyan cyanobacterial growth, including a high nutrient input of the water, high temperatures, and low flows. We also know that human activity has caused blooms uh, to increase in frequency uh, uh, from such activities such as climate change, uh, pardon, <laughs> increasing temperatures and uh, agricultural runoff resulting in nutrification. And the reason why these blooms are such an issue is because they produce, uh, some bacteria are known to produce a wide array of di uh, different types of toxins. Uh, these toxins include the hepatotoxins such as the microcystins which affect your liver the uh, neurotoxins, such as the saxitoxins, which affect your neurons, and also the dermatoxins, such as limbiotoxin A, which affect your skin. However, it's important to note that not all cyanobacteria are toxic, and usually within the species, there are uh, strains that can produce and not produce these toxins. So the toxin that I'm going to talk about today is beta-methyl-N-amino-L-alanine, otherwise known as BMAA. Uh, it's a non-protein amino acid, meaning it's not one of the 20 or so amino acids responsible for protein synthesis, it is shown to be neurotoxic and has multiple mechanisms of toxicity. And what makes BMA such an uh, interesting molecule is the fact that it has been linked to sporadic ca uh, cases of sporadic motor neuron disease. Around the world, there are several locations with a high prevalence of motor neuron disease uh, among its residents. Uh, and BMA has been found in the local environment and has been suggested that perhaps that BMA is the cause for this high prevalence of motor neuron disease in the area. BMA is also known to bioaccumulate through several different types of food webs, including terrestrial and aquatic, such as the terrestrial one on, on Guam, where it went from the cyanobacteria, uh, the symbiotic cyanobacteria living in the roots up until the, the tree's seeds, and then in the bats. And also in aquatic food webs, such as the ones in southern Florida, where it went from the algae into various crustaceans and plant, uh, not plants, uh, fish. And uh, BMA is, not, uh, is known not to be only produced by cyanobacteria, but also the eukaryotic diatoms and gynoflagellates. So BMA is commonly found around, uh, among its two isomers. These are 2,4-diaminobutyric acid and N2-aminoethylglycine, uh, otherwise referred to as 2,4-DAB and AEG. These uh, two molecules are also non-protein amino acids and are constitutional isomers of BMA. Constitutional isomer means that it has the same molecular weight and similar physiochemical properties. Uh, they're thought to be produced by the same species, so, um, being cyanobacteria and diatoms and diaphlagids, so it's essential that when we monitor one of these molecules, we are looking for all of them simultaneously to ensure that no misidentification occurs. So starting off with 2,4-DAB, it is known to be neurotoxic in its own right, so it's important to know uh, which species are capable of producing it. 
However, potentially more uh, interesting is that it's shown to uh, increase BMA's toxicity. So it's important that we know not only what species produce BMA and 2,4-DAB, but also those that are able to produce it simultaneously. AEG, on the other hand, is not known to be toxic. However, it is frequently detected in cyanobacterial cultures and cyanobacterial samples. This really emphasizes the fact that you need to uh, analyze for these molecules simultaneously to ensure that there is no misidentification occurring. So currently, BMA has been researched all around the world, from the uh, United States to South America, Africa, and all throughout Eurasia. However, until recently, there had been no studies done for BMA in Australia's environments. That was until uh, earlier this year, where a main et al. discovered that BMA was present in a number of bloom sites all throughout Eastern Australia. In this study, 16 sites were examined, and 10 of which yielded uh, BMA's, uh, had BMA present in that bloom sample. However, maybe more interesting as well is that 2,4-DAB was found in every sample, suggesting that its prevalence may be higher than BMA's. But being uh, crude, raw bloom samples that were just kind of swabbed up from the environment, we couldn't really determine what species were responsible for this uh, BMA and 2,4-DAB. So what don't we know about BMA in Australia? So firstly, there's only been one report of BMA in cyanobacterium, which was of Cylindra spermopsis from a study done by Cox et al. 2003. In this study, they examined several cultures from around the world uh, to determine like, how prevalent BMA is among cyanobacteria. However, there have been no reports of 2,4-DAB or AG in any Australian cyanobacteria. And currently, that study I mentioned before by May et al. is the only study that has examined BMA in Australia's environment. So we really don't know how truly distributed it is throughout Australia's different ecosystems. So based on this, I constructed two different aims. The first aim was to identify if uh, BMA-producing cyanobacteria are present in Australian freshwater systems. And the second one was to identify which cyanobacteria genera are able to produce BMA and its isomers. So how do we go about doing this? So just a, a basic rundown of the methodology. So first, we had, uh, went and collected various different types of samples from all across Eastern Australia. We then brought those samples back to the lab and attempted to isolate the individual cyanobacteria present in those samples. We then began, uh, we then established several different types of uh, cyanobacteria cultures, and we started growing them up. Once these cultures were established, we'd harvest them at the late exponential phase and analyze them with liquid chromatography, triple quadrupulse, mass spectrometry. So a total of 11 sites were uh, sampled in this study, and sampling occurred all throughout last year. Um, as you can see, it's all throughout Eastern Australia. We have three sites that were down around Mildura, which were on the Murray River. We had two sites around the Griffith area, and Griffith was quite an interesting uh, site to sample, as being reported by the media to have a high instance of motor neuron disease among its population. So it's quite interesting to see if we could find any species that were able to produce BMA and its isomers in that area. We also had three sites in Sydney, including Manly Dam, and three sites in the Hunter region. So when it came to sample collection, we ideally wanted to find blooms. So we tried using the Water New South Wales uh, website, which has a bloom map, which essentially just tells you where blooms are throughout New South Wales. Ideally, we'd find a nice thick scum, like the one up here, which we found in the Hunter region, but that wasn't always, always the case. Sometimes we found that the algae is more so spread throughout the waterways, and so when we found this, we had to concentrate the algae uh, in a net before bringing it back to the lab. We then had to isolate the cyanobacteria. So first, we viewed the raw algal scum uh, under the microscope to determine what species were present. Then, using an elongated pass for pets, we would then uh, pick those individual species out and put them into a 24-well plate filled with various different medias to see which uh, was the best media to grow that certain species of cyanobacteria. We then had to wait about one to two weeks uh, to determine whether or not it was of a monoculture or if there was still some contaminating algae or other microbes present. If that was the case, we'd go back and start uh, picking them out again and trying to re-establish these monocultures. But if they were ready to go, we put them in flasks and start uh, culturing them as you would any cyanobacterial culture. So once we had these uh, cultures established, it was time to determine whether or not BMA and its isomers were present in the, uh, our cyanobacteria. So first, we harvested via centrifugation at the late exponential phase. The pellet was then freeze-dried to remove any water, so we'd have just a dry pellet. That dry pellet was then resubmerged in TCA acetone and, uh, sonica uh, and it was lysed via probe sonication. This then created two different fractions of amino acids. 
So the first being your free amino acids. These are amino acids not bound or like not associated with anything. And your bound amino acids. Your bound amino acids are typically what your protein is. So as we all know, amino acids make up protein and peptides. Um, but it can be a multitude of different things. Uh, hence why we don't just call it the protein amino acids. It's bound amino acids. So your free amino acids are ready to go. However, your bound amino acids still need some type of form of release. Um, even though I mentioned before that BMA and its isomers are non-protein amino acids, they're still commonly found in the bound fraction. So it's essential that we analyze both fractions. So to release these amino acids, we then hydrolyze that pellet. So then we have two distinct fractions, our free amino acids and our bound amino acids. Um, so there's one, one more step before we could get into the mass spectrometry. And that, first of all, was to derivatize our amino acids. So first, we added an internal standard of deuterated DAB, otherwise known as heavy DAB. And then our, all our amino acids underwent propyl chloroformate derivatization. Uh, amino acids are quite hard to analyze via reg, uh, HPLC. So there are several benefits to derivatizing them. Uh, the first being, as you can see up here, this is BMA being uh, propyl chloroformate derivatized. It becomes significantly bigger, making it significantly easier to analyze in a mass spec. Um, this reduces our signal to noise ratio and it also improves our sensitivity. It also allows us to separate out our amino acids that have si similar physiochemical properties uh, significantly easier. Uh, we used the easy fast derivatization kit from Phenomenex to do this, which included a solid phase extraction cleanup to clean our sample up before we put it into the mass spec. The internal standard was added to not only account for instrumentation error, but also to account for any loss that would have occurred during this solid phase extraction. So liquid chromatography uh, triple quadruple mass spectrometry was carried out on the Agilent 1290 Infinity LC system and the Agilent 6490 triple quadruple uh, mass spectrometer. Um, the mass spec was set to positive mode and four MRM transitions were established for each uh, isomer we were analyzing. We quantified off the most abundant ion, uh, MRM transition. Uh, liquid chromatography was run in reverse phase on a C18 column and our analytes were uh, eluded via a gradient elution. As you can see, we got quite nice separation with BMA, AEG and 2,4-DAB all coming out at different times. However, you might note over here that um, our internal standard and 2,4-DAB uh, are eluded at the same time. Uh, deuterated DAB is just a heavy version of 2,4-DAB, meaning that it's deuterated. <laughs> And uh, being that, it has a different mass, which means that we can really, we can determine which is which in a mass spec. So what do we find from this? So first of all, a total of 19 different uh, cultures were established with seven different genera. Um, our most high abundant genera were that of Dolichospermum and uh, Microcystis. 17 of the 19 were found to have detectable levels of BMAA. The only two that didn't have was one Crococcus from the Hunter region and another Microcystis also from the Hunter region. However, if you look closely, you'll see that we also had a positive for each genus. We also had a, um, another isolate that was uh, capable or had detectable levels of BMA and its isomers among our cultures. 2,4 DAB, on the other hand, was found in every single one of our cyanobacterial cultures, suggesting that, like the main Natal paper, perhaps that. 2,4 DAB is more prevalent in cyanobacteria than uh, BMA is. However, there'd need to be further studies to um, really define this. And finally, 18 of the 19 uh, isolates were found to have detectable levels of AEG. Uh, and interestingly enough, it was the same, one of these species, the, the one species that didn't produce AEG was the same species of microcystis that didn't have any levels of BMA. So approximately 90% of our cyanobacteria isolated were cap uh, had detectable levels of BMA in them, and all locations yielded at least one species that was capable of BMA production. Just some uh, interesting species to talk about. First of all was Merismopedia. So in current BMA literature, there has been no uh, examination of Merismopedia for BMA or any of its isomers, and we found that Merismopedia is also capable of having, detect oh, having BMA. Uh, so this is a novel finding for this study. Um, our highest concentration of BMA, 2,4-DAB, and AEG came from the same isolate, and that was from Limbia, isolated from Anzac Creek, Moorbank. And um, finally, our isolates of Dolichospermum had a consistent ratio of free to bound BMA. Typically in BMA literature, there's been no relationship between free and bound BMA in cyanobacteria, 
as we don't really know what bound BMA is. So we really need to further examine the true nature of this bound fraction to determine what's going on here. So um, we found that BMA's prevalence in Australian bacteria is quite similar to those uh, studies that were done overseas. Several studies overseas, such as the ones done in South, America, uh, South Africa and UK, were quite similar. Uh, had similar findings with having around 90% of their cyanobacterial cultures having BMA present. 2,4-DAB and AG was also found in most of the samples. This really highlights the fact that you have to analyze these molecules simultaneously, as if you would ignore either one of these, it could lead to a uh, misidentification of BMA or 2,4-DAB in that uh, case. Uh, Australian isolates on a whole produced higher concentrations than their overseas counterparts. Whether or not that this is because Australian cyanobacteria produced more BMA, or perhaps it was just a different in analytical techniques used. Our highest concentration was 8,407 microgram per gram, and this is higher than any, published, any other publicated, uh, published studies. Interestingly enough, the, the uh, prior record holder to this was the one Australian culture examined, which was that of Cylindrospermopsis in the Cox et al. 2003 study, or 2005. Um, and finally, BMA was detected in our samples from around Griffith. Uh, as I said before, Griffith has, a high, has been reported to have a high instance of motor neuron disease. Uh, so now we've found that BMA producing cyan bacteria are present in there. However, the, a link would, a true exposure route would have to be established before we can uh, justifiably say that it is the sole reason for this high number of motor neuron disease. So just to wrap up, we know that BMA producing cyan bacteria are all throughout Eastern Australia. However, further work needs to be established to, uh, uh, to really examine the potential risks of BMA. Currently, there are several conflicting reports about whether or not BMA is responsible for this high uh, abundance of motor neuron disease in these clustered areas. We really need to examine the roots of exposure. Currently, there has been no study done to see if BMA is affected by water treatment. We need to know what concentrations pose a risk in the environment. So even though we have such high concentrations from our agricultures, we don't really know if they're realistic to those in the environment. We would like to know as well if there's any long-term exposure risks. Um, so BMA has been suggested to have not only acute but chronic toxicity. So it'd be interesting to see uh, how truly devastating it could be if you're living around uh, places that bloom, fr bloom frequently that have species that produce BMA. And finally, we don't really know if any environmental factors affect BMA production. Uh, as we already know, cyanobacterial ab uh, abundance in the environment is affected by environmental factors. So it'd be really interesting to see if, we were, if there's any environmental factors that are going to increase uh, the amount of BMA in the environment. So thanks for listening to me, and I hope I went all right. <laughs> thanks, Jake. That was a very interesting talk. Um, I've got one question before I throw it out over right. to the to the uh, floor for questions. Uh, so I'm not aware of any heterotrophic bacteria that have been implicated in BMAA, but were your cultures um, uni-algal or were, they, were any of them axenic? Uh, like, so I can't say for sure that they were like enzenic. Uh, they were definitely uni-algal, like there was no other algal species present but that one. Mm. Um, I didn't see any other like microbes in there, but I can't say without assurance that it is indeed only the algae there, no like contaminating bacteria. Are there any, any questions? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not too sure as I haven't done anything involving like bioaccumulation. It's more so research. But um, I believe in regards to the macrophytes, I'm not too sure. I wouldn't be able to give you a confident answer, to be honest. Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so interestingly enough, I sampled uh, two locations in Griffith. So one being Lake Wyangan, 
and the other being uh, in Tarbogan, which is just a neighbouring suburb over. Uh, Tarbogan was a canal which is used for irrigation, so it irrigates all their crops. Um, and Lake Wyangan, interestingly enough, which is even though it's known to constantly bloom, in times of water shortages, it is used as a drinking water supply. Um, at the time of sampling, actually, uh, that it was the uh, water, like the water supply. And I spoke to a lot of the locals, and they don't drink the water. They don't trust it. <laughs> There's no surprise there. So uh, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Take one more question. Um, so, the way we sampled essentially was, like, I was aiming for blooms because blooms are significantly easier to isolate because of the crap ton of uh, cyanobacteria. So, if it was a bloom, I'd just swipe it up, and if, like, not, I'd just throw a net out and concentrate it. Um, I wasn't, like, trying to get benthic or anything. It just, whatever was in there is what I got. Yeah. All right. I think we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Jake, for that. It was a great talk. Very interesting. <laughs>